I would invite you to take your Bibles and join me in Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7 and verse 7. Romans chapter 7 and verse 7. What then shall we say, that the law is sin? By no means. Yet if it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin. For I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had not said, you shall not covet. But sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, produced in me all kinds of covetousness. For apart from the law, sin lies dead. I was once alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin came alive and I died. The very commandment that promised life proved to be death to me. For sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me, and through it killed me. So the law is holy, and the commandment is holy, and righteous, and good. Did that which good then bring death to me? By no means. It was sin producing death in me through what is good, in order that sin might be shown to be sin, and through the commandment might become sinful beyond measure. Father, please open your word up to us, and it won't be the words of a man. It will be your spirit who touches every single immortal soul in this building and beyond. And so we ask that he uh, would find pliable hearts, that he would find open hearts, uh, that we'd find disciplined minds, and that we would indeed know that we have been in the presence of the living God and that his word has done its work in each and every one of us. And we thank you, Father, in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. Well, we resume our journey back through Paul's letter to the Romans. It certainly is the Mount Everest of theology. Uh, it is his most logical of letters that he's penned. And we find ourselves in chapter 7, back in chapter 7. And we went through verses 7 through 12 the last time we were here. And I just want to just kind of uh, bring us up to that and see where we're going from there. Is that we saw in verses 7 through 12, God's law and his relationship uh, to sin, to sin. And this shows us the importance of proper gospel preaching requires a proper understanding and application of the law. Uh, there can be no good news of the gospel unless you find yourself crushed at Mount Sinai by the law of God. Uh, you can't walk up the joyous uh, hill of Calvary without first falling down Mount Sinai. And so we saw that in verse 7, God's law defines sin uh, without a clear objective standard. And that's the, the number one problem in our world today is that uh, Pilate's question, what is truth? Uh, is permeated throughout the world. There is no objective, uh, or I should say absolute standard. There is, it's just not recognized. And as a result then, the law shows us exactly uh, sin. It shows us what's wrong. The second thing we saw in verse 8 was God's law aroused sin in the fallen flesh. Paul would say that sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, produced in me not just some kinds of covetousness, but all kinds. And for the unregenerate person, the person that doesn't know Jesus Christ, what the law does, it just multiplies sin. It just continues to just, it opens the floodgate. The things that we read we shouldn't do are the very things that we want to do, we delight to do, and we do do. Paul would also go on in verses 9 through 11 and shows us that it's the just punishment. The, the law condemns the sinner, not because the law uh, is bad, which we will see, but because the law knows no mercy. The law knows no mercy. It knows no grace. It only knows condemnation unless fulfilled in its totality, inwardly and outwardly by every human being. And then in verse 12, we find that God's law is holy, righteous, and good. And so this whole, the, the whole context here is, is these people that would say, well, Paul, the, the law must be bad because all you say is bad things about the law. And Paul would say, no, not at all. Is that he would say in verse 12, the law is holy. Uh, the law is, the commandment is holy, righteous, and good because those are the very characteristics of the lawgiver. The lawgiver is holy, righteous, and 
and good. And so we come to verse 13 today, and this is all that we are going to, uh, to go through is verse 13. And uh, there's a reason for this, and I, I hope to be able to explain that to you. Verse 13 says, did that which is good then bring death to me? By no means. It was sin producing death in me through what is good in order that sin might um, be shown to be sin and through the commandment might become sinful beyond measure. Have you anchored yourself on that verse much and thought about what Paul's trying to say? He's trying to show us, show am, the exceeding, show them the exceeding sinfulness of sin. He's trying to show us how wicked and how bad sin is. So much so that he doesn't have the words to describe it. He would have to use sin itself to describe it. And so when you look at the world around us today, and I'm talking two worlds, the world outside of the church and the world inside the church, there is a common problem among both. And it's my my opinion. And that the problem is this. What has happened to sin? What has happened to sin? The world doesn't know. The world doesn't know. So the world is acting like it should. It's when God removes his restraint, as in Romans chapter 1, and the law does its work, this is what we see. However, the church, the church has lost the meaning of sin. And when the meaning of sin is lost, the exceeding sinfulness of sin, do you know what else is lost? The gospel. The purity of the gospel. Because where there's low views of sin, there is a cheapened view of the gospel. And so it's it's extremely important in my life as well as you in the life of our church, we need to recover, may God help us recover, the exceeding sinfulness of sin. Sin is not a mistake. Sin is not something, you know, I'm just, it's just the way I am. Well, yeah, outside of Christ, it is. But no, sin is not that. And I'm so afraid we give ourselves and we even give the world a pass on sin. And I hope that God will show us his, just the consequences, the catastrophic consequences of sin, first vertically as well as horizontally, and that we will recover uh, and that we will, not, we will not tolerate even what we may call, to borrow Jerry Bridges' coinage, respectable sins. Uh, procrastination is a sin. Complaining is a sin. Anger is a sin. Gossip is a sin. Slander is a sin. Uh, evil thinking of others is a sin. And all of those things are easily tolerated even among us today. And it's not a small thing in the eyes of God. And I would even go as far as to say, I, uh, I told someone right before the service that was praying with me, uh, this is not an easy message. And the reason why it is not easy, because it hits every one of us right where we are. Because if you look in your own life, Christian, I would say that you have acceptable sins, that you have sins that you tolerate. And, and there's a reason why we have low levels of joy. And there's reasons why we have low levels of peace and low levels of, of contentment. And it's largely because we have a high tolerance of sin. I want to read some other translations of verse 13. We just read what the ESV says, be it sinful beyond measure. The King James says that sin by the commandment might be ex- become exceedingly sinful. The NAS says so that through the commandment, sin would become utterly sinful. And another translation, uh, the Amplified says through the commandment, sin might be shown up clearly to be sin, that the extreme malignity and immeasurable sinfulness of sin might plainly appear. Have you thought recently, have I thought recently just how horrible sin is? And that every problem that we see in the world today, the heinous things that are happening uh, across the sea in the Middle East, the heinous things that are happening in our country, every single problem we have in our marriages, in our relationships, in everything, the problems we had, it always traced back to a garden problem in Genesis chapter 3. It is a sin problem. Sin is so destructive that Paul, as I mentioned, would not even have words to describe it. He would have to say that sin might be sin, that it might become sinful beyond measure. I want to say, Paul, you can't use the same words to define the thing you're trying to define. But he could not grasp the magnitude, the depth, 
and the, and, and the, the heinous, destructive nature of sin. The words beyond measure means extreme, far more. And in classic Greek language, it meant, in a literal sense, to cross over high mountains or deep rivers, showing us the depth of this, th this very thing. In the context of the law, we see that the, the law not only defines sin, but the law also turns it into conscious rebellion against God. You remember in creation, at the end of it all, God said, it is very good. And the law would now say of sin, it is very bad. Very bad. There was a 17th century English Puritan named Ralph Venning. He wrote a book. It's 283 pages. It's an exposition of Romans 7, 13. And it's, it's, it's titled, The Sinfulness of Sin. And then he would preach this to his people, quote, It cannot be but extremely useful to let men see what sin is, how deadly mischievous, and therefore how monstrously eager, ugly, and odious a thing sin truly is. Mark Jones, in his recent book, Knowing Sin, it's a good book. Jones said, quote, Christians should know that a proper understanding of grace requires a thorough grasp of sin. A distorted, weak view of sin will lead to a disfigured, anemic, and unproductive theology, end quote. And that is so true. And the only way that you can possibly see sin for what it truly is, is not by looking around, and not even by looking inside. It's looking out and looking above. It's only having the Isaiah 6 vision that we're able to get a proper, even beginning understanding of just how exceedingly sinful sin truly is. And so the question is, is why is Paul, in, in verse 13, why is he trying to magnify, or I should say, why is he trying to deepen the awareness that sin reveal, uh, the law reveals the, the heinous nature of sin beyond measure? Because, friends, if you do not see this, you are not enamored and inflamed by the gospel. And the reason why perhaps we don't see conversion and the reason why we don't see the effectiveness of the church and culture is because the, the wow factor of the gospel has been lost because the wow factor of sin has been lost. And Isaiah would be confronted with the vision of the Lord. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory and the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, woe is me for I am lost for I am a man of unclean lips. I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips for my eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. I sometimes wonder if, if the Lord even comes to church with us. Now, I'm not saying that to make light of that. But every encounter you find in the Bible, I think there's 14 of them, of an individual coming confronted with God, you know what the outcome is? The outcome is a deep humility and a deep awareness of being undone, of being sinful. But when you get there and you know the gospel, you know what that produces when those two join together? Like when we gather today, there should be this overwhelming sense of privilege, an overwhelming sense of desire to see this glorious, holy, holy, holy God who comes to us and shows us how undone we are and then comes with the bomb of the gospel. And when those two meet, you know what happens? Worship. Worship. Worship isn't feeling good because the song moves you and there's nothing wrong with that. I must confess, Barrett and I listened to a song before the service this morning. Uh, I, I encourage you to listen to it. Uh, Sovereign Grace, the king and all of his beauty. Yikes. Beautiful, absolutely beautiful. But you only will come to an acceptable place of worship when you come to an acceptable place that God shows himself for who he is and who we are before him, and the gospel rushes in and br brings us up so we can worship. 
And so it's not about the entertainment factor. It's not about, it's not about you feeling good because you heard this, this moving song. And it's not about all that kind of stuff. It's about exceeding the, seeing the exceedingly sinfulness of sin in light of the exceeding glory and beauty of who God is that makes the gospel shine like the bright diamond that it truly is. And if that isn't how we see the gospel, then one of two things is wrong. We don't really know the God we claim to know, or we really don't know how sinful sin truly is. And what I want us to do is I want us to uh, begin first by defining sin. I got an outline on here, and I, I like to give you an extensive outline so you may use it for further reference and study, but I want us to work our way through a couple things here. Is one, I want us to define sin. I want us to define sin because you may say, well, I know what sin is. Well, okay, you may know what sin is. But if you truly know what sin is, then if it's a proper definition, then it is changing the way you live. Is if, if, it's just like, uh, you know, I believe in the sovereignty of God. I believe that God is in control of every single area in my life. And so then why, when things don't go the way I want, I try to change circumstances. Or things don't go the way that I'd like in people and I want to change people. You know what that is? That is a professed theology that is denied by practice. And it's the same thing with sin. Is we need, if we really understand what it is, then it should become what, it should become such the most hated and the most heinous thing that we would run from any aspects of it trying to cling itself to us. Because we see what it is. We see the destructiveness of this. There was a missionary couple and they had a little child and they were, they were in the jungles, and they were, uh, the little girl was outside playing, and mom and dad were doing their thing outside their home, and, and they've been, the little girl had been taught not to touch something that wasn't hers. Powerful lesson. And so the little girl's out playing around in the grass, and she sees this, this string of jewels that was just absolutely beautiful, and she was enamored by this string of jewels that was just glaring in beauty, but she was taught not to touch it. And so she went to her dad and said, it's a, it's a, Papa, uh, I found this string of jewels. It, it's so beautiful. Come and see it. Come and see it. And her dad went over there and he saw it and he grabbed a hold of her and pulled her away. It was one of the most deadliest snakes known to men. And it was so beautiful. And if she would have went out there and that got her, she would have been bit. She would have been, probably died because of the venom of the, of the snake. That's, that's, that's what sin is. Sin has all these beautiful, attractive things and it is pleasurable. Moses uh, said he refused the, the pleasure of sin, the pleasures of Egypt. And so we got to be careful because the world glamorizes sin to where it's eroded the church to where we think, you know, it's just, I'm a little bad. You know, it's just a little bad. You know, yeah, I, I, I got an impatient problem with my kids. No, that's a sin problem. It's a sin problem. It's not, it's not, it's, I got a little problem. It's, it's, no, it's a big problem. Because it's a big problem that reveals that we don't understand how God sees sin. And until we understand how God sees sin and the destructive nature of sin, there's no hope of genuine repentance or of transformation because of the gospel. Remember the woman caught in adultery? What did Jesus say? She's, she's crushed to the core of her being. And what did she, what did she say? Well, neither, that no one's condemned me, Lord. And the Lord looked at her and said, neither did I condemn you. Go and live as you have been. Go and sin no more. That's, that's how bad it is. And if you have a gospel that says, well, I'm saved, I believe in Jesus, but there's tolerated sin in your life, and you're not mortifying it, as Owen would say, if you're not putting it to down, you need to question, then what kind of gospel is it that you're enslaved into sin that you've been delivered from? Let's define this. I want you to look at uh, Psalm 51 for a minute. Psalm 51. We're going to define sin. And I want to do this by expanding because the goal today is for us to achieve what Paul wants us to understand. And that's the exceeding sinfulness of man. And that the law will show us that. If you were to go through every one of the Ten Commandments, the moral law... And I would encourage you to do that. And think long and hard how easily we break every one of those commands, maybe on a daily basis. Start with the last one. 
because if you know that you've committed the last one, then you don't even have to go through the rest of the nine because the last one's guaranteed that you broke the first nine. <laughs> Thou shalt not covet. There it is. You get that one, you say, I'm guilty of that one, then you've, you've just committed the first nine as well. And that shows us really how heinous sin really is. And sometimes I wonder, do we, do we grade ourselves, ourselves even as Christians on a curve? You know, we know, I mean, I got the first six, I'm okay. I'm struggling with number seven, but number eight, I'm working on it. No, it's not that way. And so what I want us to see is the total depravity of man to include sin. Because we need to see how bad we are if we're going to be overwhelmed with how good God is. Look at Psalm 51, verse 1 and 2, the total depravity of man uh, or of humanity. There are three things that Paul would say, I'm sorry, David would say concerning himself. This is recognized as his psalm of repentance uh, from his sin of Bathsheba. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out. Now notice what he says here. And, and one of the most important words he uses here is the word my. As the Lord Jesus is our personal, my Savior, uh, your sin, your transgression, your iniquity is personal too. He says, blot out my transgressions, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. He would also say the same thing in Psalm 32. You don't need to turn to it. Blessed be the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered, who the Lord counts no iniquity. There are three words that David would use, transgression, iniquity, and sin, that describe the whole depravity of every one of us. And I think, I, I know it's a little bit off of what Paul says, but this is, a, this is the family of depravity. It isn't just one. We are totally depraved. We are totally, you know, corrupt. And so David would say transgressions, iniquity, and sin. And we'll, we'll come back to sin when we go back and look at uh, the consequences of this. But the first thing he says, my transgression. Transgression is defined as crossing a forbidden boundary. And what is Transgre what transgression is associated with in the life of every human being is different than sin. Transgression is what is engulfing our world today, and in particular our, our, our nation and its celebration of abominations. Is that transgression is, is rebellion against a rightful sovereign. Do you see your depravity as such? You say, well, I, I struggle with some sin. But outside of Jesus Christ, we not only struggle with sin, but we are, we are a rebellious people against the sovereignty of God and his rightful rule over us. Well, he would go on and use the word iniquity. What does the word iniquity mean? It refers to original sin or our nature. It's the imputation of what we are in Adam. So I hope that you guys start to see that, wait a minute, I'm not just a little messed up. I've got some serious issues. Number one, I am in, I am in rebellion to, to the sovereignty who has rightful rule in my life. Secondly, I'm not only in rebellion, is that I can't help but be in rebellion because it's my nature. So by now you should be saying, where's the gospel? Where's the gospel? You should be saying, wait, I need, I need help. I can't fix me. That's precisely what the law is supposed to do. The law is supposed to show us our transgression, it's supposed to show us our iniquity, and then it's supposed to show us our sin. And sin is, as the common definition is, is to miss the mark or fall short. But what are we falling short of? Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. What is the glory of God in man? It is the reflection of His image. You and I were created to reflect His image. We are to be walking around like little Christ. We are to resp responding in, and respecting in his, his character and conforming and reflecting that. Do you know what sin has done, missing the mark? It means that you ha are incapable and you'll never be able to fulfill your created purpose. And your created purpose and my created purpose is not to live for me, my, and mine, but is to live for him, he, and all his glory. And that means reflecting him. Sin, no matter how hard I try, I can't get to that mark. 
So this is what, this is what we would see in the Scripture. And I would ask you this question. When's the last time you heard a sermon? And I'm not saying that because I'm preaching it. But when is, the, when is the last time that you've heard a sermon on the total depravity of man and that the problem is not government and the problem is not education and the problem is not, you know, world, world leaders. The problem is the depravity of man in the heart of man because we're in rebellion to God. We are failing to fill our purpose of, of reflecting His, His, uh, His glory and that by nature we can't do but. And the fact is, if you go out there in the street today and you would tell people, politicians, or tell even the common folk, even your neighbor, what is wrong with the world today, not a single person is going to tell you, well, it's because uh, we're transgressors and because we uh, have a nature that's prone to iniquity and because we always fall short of God's glory. No one's going to tell you that. And you know what's even scary? You're not going to hear that in a lot of churches. You're going to hear a gospel that makes you feel good and you can leave unchanged and create within you a false assurance that all is well and all is not well. I want us to now look at the consequences. So Paul would say that sin is exceedingly sinful beyond measure. Well, when you, when you define beyond measure a depth and a height that is immeasurable, we got to look at what I've labeled the catastrophic consequences. And like all things in the Christian life, you must not start with yourself. And that's, a, that's another problem we have. It seems like all I'm doing today is identifying problems, and, but it's true in the sense that, you know what, a lot of, of Christianity, not only does it lack a, a thus saith the Lord concerning sin, and so the wonder of the gospel is lost, but a lot of Christianity is so driven by the consumer it's so driven by what's in it for me. They would never say that. But what happens when you go to, if, you, if, if, if the church isn't providing what you want, not necessarily what you need, not what you want, you say, well, you know what, that's just, no, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not there, I'll go somewhere else. We got to understand that Christianity is not about ourselves. It's not about self-fulfillment. It's not about, you know, uh, self-awareness. Christianity is about self-denial and, self, and self-control and self-discipline for a cause greater than ours. Uh, God does not exist as a cosmic genie for us to f- give us our petition and for him to make us feel good and to cause life to be full of comfort. It is not that at all. Sin has ensured that there will never be a problem-free period in your life. You may have a couple hours. Maybe, maybe. But I'm so fearful that we don't understand just how catastrophic what happened in the garden truly was. And it must start with God. Don't look at what sin has done to you. Don't look at what other people sitting against you has done to you. Don't get, get, we'll talk about self next. It has to start with what God. The exceeding sinfulness of sin is only seen in the consequences to God. To such a wonderful creator. Such a benevolent maker. That he would have been forever content in a Trinitarian fellowship. With the, the, with the angels that didn't fall. And he could have let us all receive what we just deserve. And he would have been still the same. Let's take a look at this. The first thing. What does sin do then to make it exceedingly sinful and its consequences against God? The first one is it, and primarily, it offends his nature and his person. It offends his nature and his person. Now, let's don't try to equate offending to like sometimes that we're offended. Sometimes someone will offend you and say, ah, it's no big deal. Don't, don't worry about it. When really it is a big deal and it does bother you. You just don't want the conflict. In God's case, his transcendent holiness in his nature and his person is greatly offended. It is indeed the greatest offense that sin has done. In Revelation 4.8, 
we find holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Do you know what holiness is going to be? Edwards preached a wonderful sermon, heaven is a place of love, and he would not dismiss that heaven is also a place of holiness, absolute holiness. And do you want to know what marks the holy place of heaven? It is the fixation is on the holy one, not on the worshipers. Read Revelation 4 and 5. The fixation is not on the worshipers. Because God in heaven is exalted. His nature and his person is on display and is forever without any rebellion, without any transgressions, without any iniquity, without any sin. It's all gone. And all that heaven is occupied with is the lamb standing by the throne and the God who occupies the throne forever. Do you know that that's what the church is to be? In small measure, I get that. We're not going to get there forever. I mean, get there in this world. But Habakkuk says, 113, you who are of pure eyes than to see evil and cannot look at wrong. The king in all his beauty, that's what heaven's all about. And when sin entered the world, it was the great offense to our God, a great offense to his nature. And so drive this home in your own life right now. It, are, there, are there tolerated sins in your life right now that you know you're struggling with but you're not doing battle against? Do you understand what that is? It's not a horizontal issue between a, a husband and a wife or, or parents and kids. It's not, it's not a horizontal issue. It's a vertical issue. Is it our sin, even the smallest one? The devil got kicked out of heaven for what? One, it was pride. And so the angels, the fallen angels, and they're, they're locked up forever because of that one. They'll never know redemption. And so ask God if you don't have this to see that even the slightest sin, the unkind word that comes out of your mouth, the impulsive display of anger that comes out of your mouth, those are direct offenses to God because sin is exceedingly sinful beyond measure because it is a direct affront on his holy nature. And I don't say that to cause you to say, oh, I'm undone. Well, yeah, I do say that to cause you. To, yeah, I do. Because I want you to be so undone and I want you to look into your heart and say, I have allowed this for too long. Oh, God, be merciful to me, still yet a sinner. And he'll come rushing in there with the power of the gospel. And he'll say to you, just like he said to the woman caught in adultery, I don't care what sin you've ever committed or whatever's troubling you right now that you're tolerating. God will say to you what he said to her. Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. There's something else, though. Another consequence of sin. Not only is it this, this ugly offense towards our creator. It also is the act of rebellion or refuses his truth and authority. It refuses his rightful, that's what transgression is. And sin is missing that mark, which is coupled with that because we're not living up to our created purpose, which is mean, I don't want to live for your purpose. I want to live for my purpose. And that's rebellion. Romans 1.18, we saw that a few months ago. Uh, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. You see, this suppression, no one is, no one can, is without, no one has an excuse. No one was out of, uh, it, it lacks an excuse, can't stand before God and say, I didn't know, because it's written within. And because it's written within, uh, you're, you're not off the hook. And what we see, and you see it all through, you see it in, 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 in homes that are a wreck because authority is being attacked. You see it in government. You see it in schools. You see it everywhere is that there is this anti-authority spirit that is so prevalent. And it transfers over to the church. To where church doesn't realize that God also places 
places it under authority, spiritual authority. Fallen men, yes, but elders. And the head of the church himself. You remember the parable of the ten minas? The nobleman went into a far country to receive a kingdom and then returned. And he left, uh, he left ten servants to do the work. And the citizens said of the nobleman, and in the parable of the nobleman is Christ, the, the, uh, the citizens of the city says, we do not want this man to reign over us. That's what the world says every day about the Lord Jesus. It's a direct it's a direct affront, not only on his nature and his person, but his rightful authority. And friends, when there's not submiss- submission to rightful authority in the home, not submission to parents, if there's not submission in the schools to the authorities, if not submission, you know, uh, rightful authority in, in the government, if there's not proper submission, it's chaos. It's chaos. Hell is going to be a place of Chaos. And people that go there are going to go there because, one, they never met the liberating power of the gospel. They have offended God and his nature and his person by their transgressions, by their iniquity, by their sin. And they have refused his rightful rule in their life. So, Christian, let me ask you this question. Do you find in your life that there are perhaps areas in your life that you are kicking against the goads? Are there areas in your life, perhaps it's in your relationships, perhaps it's in a boss at work that kind of grinds you a little bit? It could be anything, but let me ask you, is there, is there anything in your life right now that you're trying to wear the yoke of yourself and Christ's yoke? I would say you probably got some chaff burns on the back of your neck because you're kicking against something you can't win. And so Christian, if that's you, then likely you're a tolerating sin and you are trying to have your will and his will and he will share his glory with no one. It will be his will or it won't be. I think it was F.B. Myers that said he will either be Lord of all or he will not be Lord at all. And that's a pretty good, a pretty good uh, understanding of the Lordship of Christ in the believer's life. And so sin, the exceedingly sinfulness of sin, the law magnifies this. And we see that, that first and foremost, the catastrophic consequences is against God. It offends his nature and his person. It refuses to bow the knee to his truth and authority. And here's what is going to be, is going to be something, is that there are scores of people around us that are not bowing their knees to the Lord Jesus. But there are going to be a time that every knee will bow their knee to the Lord Jesus. So if you're not a Christian today, let me, let me encourage you, bow now. Bow now. Understand that you are an absolute total mess. And that you are full of transgression. You are, you are by nature, iniquity has got you to do nothing but rebel. And that you are constantly falling short of the glory of God. And no amount of religion, no amount of works, nothing will relieve that blanket off of you. And so bow your knee now today and call out, I am a transgressor. I am by nature against you. I am a sinner. I'm constantly fall, and, and I have no hope, but I place my hope of what you said you have done in him who was wounded for our transgressions. Run to the gospel today. If you're not a Christian, run today. And if you don't run today, you're going to find it easily easier and easier to reject, reject as you go on. And if you're a Christian today and you're finding your Christian life not full of joy and you're stressed and you're struggling with over-the-top anxiety and fear and all that, get a hold with God and say, Lord, is there areas in my life that are offending you because I've taken a light view of sin? Am I refusing to bow my knee to your rightful authority over me? We'll talk about that tonight in, the, uh, in one of the blessings we have from Christ. It's redemption. And remember, it's... Redemption means bought, uh, but it means bought from something to something. And then we find the, the third thing, the third thing that is a great offense towards God. It's why we're here today. Is it sin? And we could extend iniquity and transgression. You know what sin does? It desecrates his worship. 
it desecrates his worship. I read Revelation 4 and 5. That's pure worship. Jesus tells a woman at the, at the well, what? That we are to worship in spirit and truth. What is that? That is to worship in sincerity and by his word. Do you know what the greatest battle that you had today? The greatest battle. Yeah, I know. Getting up and, uh, and getting everybody ready to go to church. I know that's a war. I, I, got, I, I got that. I, I got that. We live, we live that, and I'm so glad that things that are past are gone. You know? But the greatest battle you had, and it's still raging right now, the greatest battle you have right now is the battle of sincere worship versus hypocrisy in your worship. And there, it's called the battle of distractions. Is that there's probably some of you right now, and I'm, I'm not going to call you out because I don't know, you know, but I've, I've been there, and I've been there from standing here. Is that there are some of you that right now that is 25 till 12, and you left about a half hour ago. Now, you're still here, but you've left about a half hour ago. You're already, you're already planning on what you're going to do this afternoon. Uh, you're already into Wednesday with your planner. I mean, some of your, I find that some of my best planning and best of my uh, addressing my emails and stuff I happen when I want to sit down and read my Bible or pray. So there may be some of you that are already into Wednesday or maybe you're already into next week. I don't, late next week. And there's some of you that have never let go of the past week. That you came here today all bruised and battered from, from the past week. And you're coming here wounded and hurt. And some well-intended brother or sister looked at you and said, How are you doing? And you just pulled it up inside of you and you said, oh, I'm fine. And you're not. That's your greatest battle every day. I mean every week is coming to, to church and fighting off distractions so that you will not be guilty when Jesus says, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me. This probably should be the time we just stop and repent. Because I'm convinced that we, that a lot of what we call worship may fall short of that because of distractions. You say, well, I can't help it. Well, yeah, we can. I mean, I, I think the gospel is sufficient. Now, I'm not trying to make it easy, uh, and it's not, but there is this something about the renewing of our mind and getting fixed and trusting the Spirit of God to make worship what it's supposed to be. I mean, God says that He is seeking worshipers in spirit and truth, so if He seeks them, that means He's going to provide them and that He's going to help us to do this. So I, I was going to say, well, all of you that are no longer here, uh, just get up and leave, but I was afraid it'd be empty. So... Uh, <laughs> I'm just kidding you. I really am. I don't believe that for a second. But let's face it. This is the hardest battle you face. And it's a battle between sincerity and hypocrisy. And if the gospel is good enough to save us for all eternity, it certainly is good enough and powerful enough to help us to worship in spirit and truth. All right, here's, uh, now let's move on. And we're winding this down. We're, now, what about the consequences of humanity? What has sin done to humanity? And this is equally catastrophic. For God, and foremost, it offends his nature and person. Secondly, it refuses his truth and authority. Thirdly, it desecrates his worship. And by the way, one thing on distractions, I would say it's a very acceptable uh, prayer to come here. And if you feel yourself like the hymn writer, sheep prone to wonder, just cry out to God and say, Lord, I don't want to be that. I want to worship you in spirit and truth. Please, what I sing, let it come from my heart and mind, not just my lips. Tell him the struggles. And tell him you long for that day in the revelation where you will not have any of that. I believe it's a very acceptable prayer to tell him, I don't want, I don't, what's happening to me, I don't want it. Don't just allow it to happen to you. Go to war. That's what it is. It's a battle. Okay, let's talk about uh, um, horizontally. What are the consequences to, uh, to humanity? And the first one, it severs man's most important relationship. Friend, if you've been a Christian, make sure, and you've been a Christian for any length of time, please go back often to the gospel, I mean, I'm sorry, to the garden, and remember what happened, refresh your mind what happened. That's why I think going into the new year, and, and many of you will do Bible reading plans, and they almost all start in Genesis. That's not bad. That's pretty good because you need to go back and you need to realize what happened in the garden. The saddest thing ever is that God and man were in harmony and sin comes and 
it's severed. And only the gospel will we will re- re- repair that. So it severs man's most important relationship. Paul would say to the Ephesians, remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope but without God in the world. That's, that's what you were outside of Christ. And that's what a large uh, percentage of the people around us are right now. And think about the own troubles you have in your own life as a Christian. Can you imagine trying to slug out what's happening in our world and not be a Christian? Unbelievable. It's no wonder we see suicide rates up. It's no wonder we, why we see drugs and see all the fentanyl and see all the stuff that's happening around to young people and not just young people. It's no wonder we're seeing all the chaos and all the shootings and stuff. Is that people are without hope. And that's what happened to sin and transgression and iniquity. It severed not only the relationship of God with man, but it also removed all hope. And it is a horrible, dark place to be without hope. I've been reading a book. Um, it's called, it's by uh, the, uh, a German. Um, he's a Jew, he was a Jew. Eli Wessel. Eli Wessel, not a German, but Eli Wessel. He was in Germany. Uh, he died in 18, uh, he died in 2016. He wrote a book, uh, he wrote 30 some books um, called Night. Night. Um, it's not a very big book. It's a hard book. He also won the Nobel Peace Prize in 1986 for his role as a literary and political spokesman on behalf of Jews and other groups who suffered persecution and death uh, due, to, uh, due to that very thing, persecution. Wessel, as a teenager, he and his family, they were deeply devout Jews living in Germany. They were taken from their home in 1944. They were immediately shipped to Auschwitz and then to Buchenwald. The book he writes is called, as I mentioned, Night. It is a terrifying record of his experience in the concentration camps where he witnessed the death of his family, the death of his innocence, and despair as a Jew confronting the absolute evil that's associated with, uh, with, with the Holocaust. He wrote this book shortly after the Allied liberation. Uh, if, it's Like I said, it's not an easy book, but it is, if you want to understand how bad humanity is, we can see that, which is what's happening in, 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 um, in the Middle East with Hamas, but it's something that it really caused me to think, is that sin is not a light thing. Sin unleashed by mankind upon mankind has been absolutely catastrophic. Whistle writes this. He writes this after recalling watching the rings of black smoke unfurl in the sky, smoke that emanates from the furnaces into which he watched his little sister and his mother be thrown into. He writes this, Never shall I forget that night the first night in camp that turned my life into one long night, seven times sealed. Never shall I forget that smoke. Never shall I forget the small faces of the children whose bodies I saw transformed into smoke unto a silent sky. Never shall I forget those flames that consume my faith forever. Never shall I forget the nocturnal silence that deprived me for all eternity of the desire to live. Never shall I forget those moments that murdered my God and my soul and turned my dreams to ashes. Never shall I forget these things, even were I condemned to live as long as God himself. Never. Sin is no light matter. And you say, well, yeah, but that's the Holocaust. What was Christ crucified for? All sin, yes, even our procrastination, yes, even our laziness, yes, even all these trivial things that we think which are not. And what it reveals to us is that sin has robbed man of hope. There's no hope. And when Christians start to drift into that because of their circumstances, then we've had a a low view of sin and we've lost the wonders of the power of the gospel to give what every human being needs if they're going to survive, and that is hope. Hope. 
And friends, it's you and I's responsibility to live the gospel and to give them hope. And we won't live the gospel unless we're in all of the gospel that delivered us from the, the evils of evils and that of sin. Number two, okay, we gotta hurry. Number two. Not only does, um, <clears throat> does sin horizontally in our human relationships sever our most important relationship and thus rob us of hope, but it also removes from us our source of happiness. Our source of happiness, contentment, and purpose. Again, Christian, now if you're not a Christian today and you're trying to find contentment and happiness and, and purpose in all the things of the world, I, I got that. I did that too. Is that outside of Christ, that's all you got to pursue. I got that. If you're a Christian though, let me say this. Let me say it because I love you. Shame on you. Why are you trying to find in human relationships, in human material things, in human pleasure, in human accomplishments, why are you trying to find in what is only found in Christ and you even know better? Is that we know better? And if you need a reminder, go back to Ecclesiastes. I won't read it for the sake of time, but read uh, Ecclesiastes 2, 1 through 11. Solomon says, Then I consider all that my hands had done, all that I expended, and I kept my heart from no pleasure, and at the end of it all, it was a striving after wind, and there was nothing to be gained under the sun. That's what sin does. It deceives you to think that you can find in the world and in human beings what can only be found in Christ. And, and really, you know what we want as Christians, and again, you can correct me afterwards, but if you want to, I'm going to run out so you can't catch me. Um, <laughs> I think we all want a pretty easy life. We want a pretty easy Christian life too. We don't want any pain. We don't want any suffering. But maybe just a little bit we can manage. We, we, want, we want an easy street. We really do. And I thought about that and I come across this little uh, illustration. Did you know that there actually is a street called Easy Street? It's in Honolulu. It's in Hawaii. Here's the directions. Take Palais Highway northbound, travel about a third of the way uh, to get to a pass, turn right on Park Street, go one block, and there it is right in front of you, Easy Street. Turn left. He says, and as you go about a block, you're going to see another sign. It says, dead end. <laughs> it's true. There's no easy street in life. It all leads to a dead end. That's probably the illustration is Ecclesiastes chapter 2. Because Solomon would say the same thing, dead end. And then finally, this is what sin does. Humanly speaking, it not only severs our most important relationship with God, leading to no hope. It not only blinds us and removes the only true sense of happiness and contentment and purpose, but sin, the exceeding sinfulness of sin enslaves us to the bondage of self-love. It enslaves us to the bondage of self-love. And it's a bondage who change that only the gospel can break. Paul would say in 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5, but understand this, in the last days, people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, lovers of pleasure, rather than lovers of God. And that is the world we live in. That's ensnared by the exceeding sinfulness of sin. You're in bondage to self-love and you can't be free from it apart from the gospel. So application, do you see sin first and foremost what it's done to God? Secondly, do you see sin for what it's done to us? May God help us to get alone with him and let him reveal to us because he wants to Real to us how awful sin is so that we can be worshipful to how great the gospel is. And may God help us not only to see it how bad it is, but to see our helplessness against it and run to the cross. And non-Christian, as I've pleaded with you earlier, if you're not a Christian today, you're, you are in the, you're in the binding of Satan that you are wrapped up in transgression, iniquity, and sin, and the gospel is your only hope. Please, run to God. He's promised to grant you repentance and saving faith. Turn to him, because he'll turn to you. Let's pray.
Father, thank you so much for loving us and thank you for being so patient and kind to us. When we think, and I know how easy it is to take sin for granted, to say, well, it's just a little sin. And Solomon would tell us it's the little foxes that spoil the vine. May you help us, Father, to be mindful that it is no light thing, any sin. For one, put your son on the cross. And may we see sin always in light of the price that was paid and how it attacks your character, your person. It desecrates your worship. And it causes us, Father, to be in bondage, severed from the most important relationship we'll ever have. Let us think on these things, Father. For Jesus' sake, amen. Thank you.